This video is about different parameter passing models, and one of the most common models is the in mode of parameter passing, which can also be called uh, pass by value. And this parameter passing mode is used by Java, it's used by many other languages. Even when a language has support for other parameter passing modes, it usually has some form of support for in mode parameter passing. So let's see some examples. Here's an example of a fairly standard type of function or static method called manipulate. It takes two parameters, an integer x and a double value y, and these are passed by value. And so what that means is that when I make the call here, I have two actual parameters, five, and then I have a variable z but this gets dereferenced to the value in that variable, 10.5. So the actual parameters that are sent are the values 5 and 10.5. When I pass by value, I copy those values directly over into the definition here so that the formal parameters take on those values before the execution of my code body. So now that those variables or parameters have been assigned values, I can execute the body. And notice here that I do modify the value of y before then computing a result and returning it. However, the variables defined here are in no way associated with the parameters being sent in here, uh, in the sense that no change to those variables made inside of this method body affects the variables outside of it. Now this is true no matter what those variables are called. Uh, even if I had named this variable y, that wouldn't be relevant. And obviously in this case, with the 5, I don't even have a variable to modify. I have an integer literal, so I can't modify it. And when I run the code, I get this output. z is 10.5 and result is 26. Just driving home the point that z did not change and result is the sum of those numbers after doubling the second parameter, which was the 10.5. So that example shouldn't have been surprising to anyone, but there are other less common types of parameter passing methods. And the ones I'm gonna talk about now are out mode and in out mode. Out mode is often called pass by result. And one type of in out mode parameter passing is pass by value result. However, we'll see some alternatives to these three labels in a moment. First, let's look at an example in ADA. Here is the text of a short ADA program along with its output. What we see here is that we have a procedure called diff modes that takes three parameters but for each parameter I get to define the parameter passing mode so I have a parameter a that is an integer passed using in mode passing parameter b passed using out mode passing and parameter c passed with in out mode now the actual code of the procedure is here and then we have a main procedure defined at the bottom. And before this code, we define several variables that are used in that procedure. So x, y, and z are variables accessible within the main procedure down here. And I'm going to call my diff modes procedure with those variables. But what happens when these go in? When diff modes x, y, z is called, we have to look at those parameters and also the mode that's being used for each one. So the first positional parameter, A, in the diff modes procedure is an in mode parameter. That means we're going to take the value of x defined inside of the main procedure, which happens to be 12, and we're going to copy that into the parameter a in the diff modes procedure. So this is exactly what happened in Java. A value here was copied over, 
the value of the formal parameter in the procedure definition now equals the actual value of the parameter that was passed in. Nothing new there. But what about y and z? Well, the second positional parameter in diff modes, b, is an out mode parameter. So what is an out mode parameter? Well, recall that this is also known as pass by result. So with out mode parameters, we're not actually passing something into the procedure. Rather, we're getting a result out of it. What we're really doing is just passing a storage location that will eventually store a result produced inside of the procedure. This provides an easy way to return multiple values from a procedure because you could have multiple out mode parameters. However, it means that the values of those parameters shouldn't really be used in the procedure, at least not before they've been assigned a value within the procedure. In fact, the value 44 that is assigned to y for the main procedure is completely ignored in this procedure call here. So although the value of y is 44 initially, I can actually demonstrate in the code that if I try to print out the value of the parameter b in the procedure, it'll give a warning because Ada knows that that's a bad sign. Warning b may be referenced before it has a value. But also, when I print the value of b here, the actual value that gets printed out is zero. So that value of 44 is never copied into b at all. Rather, b just takes on a default value of zero while it's waiting for a value to be returned. The value that gets assigned to b inside the procedure is 100. So this 100 is assigned here. And at the completion of the procedure, that 100 is copied back and overwrites the 44 that was originally in the Y. That's why later in the main procedure, when I print out Y, the value we see here in the output is 100. So let's remove this unnecessary print statement and go back to our original code. We'll run that and we'll figure out what in out mode parameter passing is. Essentially, we're just combining the features of in mode and out mode parameter passing. So z has a value of 30 when it is used in this procedure call. So the value of z at this point is 30. Because I have in mode, I will copy the value 30 into the formal parameter C. So 30 is copied over, and at the beginning of the execution of this diff modes procedure, the value of C is indeed 30, as seen in the output here, which comes from this line of code. However, I then change the value of C, setting it equal to itself times 2. So I'm modifying this 30 into 60. And because this is an in and out mode parameter, that value 60 will be copied back into Z at the completion of the procedure execution. So the 60 overwrites the 30, which is why in the final output, down here, when I output z, I get a 60 here. One more thing that's worth knowing about eta is that when a parameter is only an in mode parameter, it'll actually prevent you from assigning a new value to it. I tried executing this code and got an error assignment to in mode parameter is not allowed. This is one of Ada's many reliability and safety checks that prevents you from doing something that maybe you didn't intend to do. However, 
going back to our earlier Java example in which the parameters are all being passed by value with in mode parameter passing, you'll see that Java actually does allow me to change the value of y inside the body of the method even though that value change doesn't propagate back to the initial calling method. It's a little bit of extra flexibility, but at the cost of some potential confusion. C Sharp also allows for out mode parameter passing. Here I have a function, diff modes, that takes an integer x, which by default is assumed to be passed with in mode parameter passing. And then I have the parameter y, which I explicitly designate as being an out mode parameter. The value of x is modified, so I can modify my in mode parameters in the body of the procedure, but that modification won't be copied back. However, when I copy the value of x into the value of y, that modification to y is copied back because y is an out mode parameter. So notice that the initial value of y is 10 in my main right here. And when I call diff modes, I have to explicitly indicate that I'm aware of the fact that y is being sent as an out mode parameter. So this happens both in the call and in the header. And then I'm going to write out the values of x and y. And as we see in the output of this code, x equals 7, which was the original value. So multiplying x by 2 inside of the procedure body did not modify the value of x. However, the new value of y in the output is 14. So that did change. One more thing worth being aware of is that if I try to access the value of an out mode parameter before it's been assigned, as I'm doing here, I will actually get an error saying I'm trying to use an unassigned out parameter. So in C sharp, I am not allowed to access an out mode parameter until I have assigned a value to it. So we've associated the concept of in mode passing with pass by value and the concept of out mode passing with pass by result. And we've also given an example where in out mode is associated with pass by value result. So we send in a value, but we also send back a result. However, this is not the only mode of in out mode passing. The other very common one is pass by reference. A true example of pass by reference semantics can be seen in the C++ language. I make a small change to my function signature by putting an ampersand in front of a variable and that means that that variable will be passed by reference rather than by value. In the main function I assign a value of 7 to x and 10 to y and I send those variables x and y in my function call. The value 7 is received by x, but y is only receiving the reference. The consequence of this is that when I modify y here, I'm actually modifying the original memory cell defined in the main function. In contrast, when I modify the value x here, I'm only modifying a local memory cell that ceases to exist at the end of this function call. So you'll see that I send in values 7 and 10. Before I send that in, I print out both values. In the function, I print out both values. After the modification, I print out both values. And then after returning, I print out both values. And I already have the output visible for you here. And we see that in main, indeed, the values are 7 and 10. At the beginning of the function, they are still 7 and 10. I modify x by multiplying it by 2 to get 14. I modify y by adding 100 to get 110. But only the modification to y persists after I return from
from the mode examples function. X here retains its original value of 7 because the X inside the main function was different from the X inside of the mode examples function. So I said this was C++ code, and indeed, I did compile it using the G++ compiler. However, I have some identical code in a file just called passing.c, and if I try to compile that with a plain C compiler, I actually get an error. Now this seems odd because C has pointers, and you can pass things by reference. However, I have to use slightly different syntax. To downgrade this C++ code back to C code, instead of using the ampersand there, I'll use the asterisk to indicate a pointer. However, if I make this be a pointer variable, then I have to use the pointer here, and here, and here, and here as well. Also, in the main function, when I call mode examples, I have to indicate that I'm sending the reference for the pointer. So I've modified this code, but now it should compile in C. And sure enough, I get the same results as before. And of course, because C++ code is backwards compatible with C, if I were to try compiling my newly written C code with the C++ compiler, that would work fine and also produce the same results. And now back to Java. Many are fond of claiming that Java uses pass-by-value semantics for primitive types, but pass-by-reference semantics for object types. This is not quite true. Here's an example where I have an inner class container that has an instance variable value that gets assigned in the constructor. In my main method, I create a new container containing a value 20. So that means 20 will be contained in this value here. And then I call my static method modify contents. It takes a container and it modifies the value in that container to be the value of this parameter, the integer v. So when I run this and print out the contents of the container after the method call, indeed we see that the contents have changed. They were initially 20, I changed them to 100, and we can witness that change. So what we see here is that even though container C was created in the main method, a modification that was made to it inside of the modify contents method did indeed affect the original container C that was defined in the main method. That looks like pass by reference semantics. However, if I set C equal to a new container here, which contains a value of 90, and run the resulting code, we'll see that the contents are still 100 after the return from the call to modify contents. That's because Java is not using pass by reference semantics it's actually using pass-by-value semantics even for its object types. So how does that make sense? When I create the container C inside the main method, C is a reference variable. So the actual thing stored in the memory cell associated with that variable is a reference to some other location on the heap of an instance of a container object. Now inside that container object instance is a memory cell associated with the instance variable value. And for the specific container I create in the main method, that value is 20. When I call modify contents, 
with C as a actual parameter, I have another formal parameter C defined inside of modify contents. So there is a separate formal parameter C inside modify contents as well as a formal parameter V. Now V is a primitive type so it's not too complicated. It's going to have the value 100. That shouldn't be surprising. But what about C? Well, C will point to the same container instance on the heap is the value of C defined inside of the main method. However, this is a distinct memory cell. In fact, later in the code, when I say that C equals a new container with a value of 90, all that does in terms of the memory model is it modifies where this reference is pointing and instead makes it point at a totally new container instance whose contained value is 90. So this new container exists on the heap near the end of the execution of the modify contents method. However, the actual parameter C and V are cleaned up and removed when modify contents finishes executing, which means there's no longer any way to access this container that contains a 90. And eventually this gets cleaned up by garbage collection. So Java only uses pass by value semantics, but when it comes to objects, which are reference variables, the specific thing being passed is the memory address being referred to. That allows us to get some of the benefits of pass by reference semantics. Namely, we don't have to copy really large objects in memory. We can just copy a small reference and then modify the contents of the contained object. I'm going to end this video with one more weird parameter passing method known as pass by name, or sometimes also called pass by need. Now, this is not a very popular or common parameter passing method, but it does exist in one prominent language, a purely functional programming language known as Haskell, which has lazy evaluation. So let's wrap up with one quick example in Haskell. I'll be doing this example using the Glasgow Haskell compiler interpreted mode and what I'll tell you to start off with is that Haskell has a sum function and I can also make a list by just saying one dot dot and then the highest number I'm going up to. So this would be a list of numbers from one up to that large number and if I press enter on this takes a little bit of time to compute the result because it has to process a lot of numbers and it takes a lot of time to add up all those numbers. And so what's the point? Well, pass by name or pass by need, which in Haskell is tied to this concept of lazy evaluation, means that I don't bother evaluating a parameter unless I need it immediately for a given computation. This is related to the concept of short circuit evaluation which is very common in evaluating Boolean expressions in various programming languages. So let's see an example in action. I'm going to let the value of x equal this expression. but I'm going to let x have that value and doing that doesn't take any time at all. That's because Haskell didn't actually compute what this is. It just made a note saying that, oh yeah, x, it's the sum of all those numbers and if you ever actually need that result, I'll compute it later. This is really convenient because Haskell has a function called head which takes the first value in a list. So if I have a list of 1, 2, 3, and I get the head of the list, it just returns 1. 
well, what if I have a list that contains x in it? It returns 1 immediately because I can easily see what's at the front of the list without bothering to compute what x is. So I still have not computed what the sum of all these numbers is. That will only be computed if and when it is actually needed. But until then, the program doesn't bother wasting any time doing it. So this is definitely useful in the context of Haskell. It works here because it is a purely functional programming language and there's no risk of any side effects. Normally if you have call by name semantics, there's an issue where the point at which you evaluate an expression might lead to different results depending on other things that have happened in the code in the meantime. But it's not an issue in Haskell, which is why this is probably the best example of this unusual parameter passing scheme. However, in most cases, the other ones I've discussed, value result and value result, and then also pass by reference, are what you'll see in a typical programming language.